Once again, I'd just like to welcome everybody here. Thanks for coming along to the uh, SES12 uh, press press conference. Um, let me first of all let you know what's going on, and then we'll get into the specifics of what we're actually doing with the mission. Um, as you know, we're not launching tonight. We, uh, we haven't rolled out to the pads. We're actually still in the hangar. Um, we are working uh, a couple of issues, and the SpaceX want to run some more tests on the on the other stage. The situation is going to be at the moment that uh, we would uh, commence countdown again on Sunday. So we will be looking for a launch uh, early Monday morning, at half, half past midnight, at that sort of time. Uh, we have worked together with uh, Airbus, and we've worked together with uh, SpaceX to uh, increase the launch window. So we're looking at a four hour launch window, uh, which gives us more opportunity to find a stop in the weather. So to give you an idea of probably what we're gonna do, is we're gonna stop the countdown at around about 70 minutes and then we're going to wait. And we're going to work together with the 45th uh, Space Wing uh, Weather Squadron and look for a slot. We're actually going to thread the needle. We're going to wait till we, we get no, no cloud cover, winds are good, and then we're going to launch. It's going to be real time. So uh, I, I can't tell you exactly what time we're going to launch. It's going to be sometime after half past midnight and sometime before half past four. So it's going to be a long night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's all I can tell you. It's definitely going to be long. But we're not going to just to make that absolutely clear. So that's the that's where we are at the moment. That's the status. Um, testing is ongoing as we speak at the moment. Um, then um, hopefully we'll get everything cleared and we'll be ready to roll out just after, or probably around about three o'clock on Sunday morning. And then uh, we we'll start to uh, start moving into the final, final phase of the launch. Okay. Okay. So SCS is twelve. Um, some background on this. This is the most powerful uh, spacecraft that we've ever had built for us. Um, total output power uh, is around about 16 kilowatts on the payload, 19 kilowatts overall. It's really, really big. Um, it's the 11th Eurostar 3000 that's been built for us by uh, Airbus. And um, <clears throat> it's almost full electrical racing. Uh, we have a little bit of chemical on board. We use the chemical just to raise the parachute after we have the uh, separation from the launch vehicle. But otherwise, it's all electrical bit raised. So it takes us a while to get there. At the moment, if we launch uh, this weekend, we'll be looking to come into service in uh, January, February, at that sort of time frame. After we've actually come up onto uh, geostationary, after we've, uh, <coughs> excuse me, after we've done that, you know, we're testing, and we're going to do a whole variety of tests before we actually come into service, and we hand it over to uh, to the customers to start our transmission. This, um, in fact, it's taken around about 39 months to build. So you can think that we were actually designing this around about four years ago. So it was really the early days of digital processing, but around about 25% of the uh, payload is processed. Uh, the mass, when we weighed it the other day, um, you can put this in your numbers, is 5,383 kilos, 850 grams. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> okay. okay, so that's all good. Um, we're looking for a design lifetime, not all design lifetime of 15 years. In fact, we're going to do much better than that, and I'll tell you why in, in just a moment. Um, the satellite, or well, the spacecraft, is still a spacecraft at the moment. It's a, ah, it's a good definition for you guys, sir. It's at the moment a spacecraft. It only becomes a satellite when it makes orbit. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Huh? So it's worth coming to these things, right? <laughs> okay. So, <coughs> the mission is, uh, we're going to 95 degrees east, the <coughs> um, and it's going to be co-located with SES-8. And that's quite interesting, because SES-8 was the first satellite that we launched with SpaceX, just by coincidence, but uh, so we're going to 95 east. Um, and it has two major, major missions. So this is basically two satellites in one. Um, if we built this thing <coughs> years ago, we'd have actually built two satellites, but we had the opportunity with Airbus together to bring them into one common bus by using the electrical orbit race capability. So the first mission is the wide beam mission. We have six wide beams on board, um, the KU band. Uh, we have 44 transponders installed, KU band transponders on the wide beams, and we'll be utilizing around about 36 of them <coughs> at one time. And the beams cover from South Asia, into China, Southeast Asia, West Central Asia, Northeast Asia, and Australia. So really immense coverage through these six beams gives us a huge amount of, of capability there. And as I say, I'm going to ask uh, JP to come up and tell you a little bit more about the specific market uses of this in, in, in just a moment when I'm through. The second part of the mission is dedicated towards data, and that's a, a high throughput mission that we have. Um, we have 70 
KU beams using frequency reuse. Uh, we have 11 KA beams for the various different gateways to actually uh, uplink, downlink the uh, data into the spacecraft. And uh, we have two KU band gateways as well. Um, we have around about 14 gigahertz of capacity here, and um, it's pretty useful for enterprise, for BSA, mobility, and I say I'm not going to, to take uh, JP Stunder on this one. This is our sixth, yeah, sixth SpaceX launch. Um, the launch vehicle is expendable. We won't be attempting a landing. As you can see, the barge is out, sorry, the autonomous drone ship <laughs> is out there, and it's not going out. So we've actually stripped off everything off the uh, first stage. There are no landing legs on board, so this is going straight in the ocean. Um, it's a, the, the first stage is a block four, and the other <laughs> stage is a, a block five. Uh, we get a lot of performance from this vehicle, really a lot of performance. And we're going super sync, so uh, we're actually going to an apogee of around about, I have to look at my notes here, around about uh, 58,000 kilometers. So we're going really high. We're almost going to the limit of what we can do with the spacecraft. So um, this is going to be a really, really good mission. Um, and the heritage limit <coughs> is around about 294 kilometers. Now, the good side of all this is that it actually extends our life capability from 15 to 22 years. So that's enormous. And secondly, um, it allows us to get to, onto orbit a little bit quicker. So we're going to save around about 20 days on our orbit racing. So this allows us to come into service in, in January, late January, early February of, of, of next year, which is uh, really, really good. Um, so we've talked about the, the launch window. Uh, we're working hard towards this. Um, SpaceX, I, I know, are working around the clock, basically, to get this thing ready. And uh, we're looking, as I said, to, to, to launch just after midnight on Monday. So stick around for, for that one. Um, what I would do now is maybe ask JP sure. if you just want to see uh, maybe a little bit, bit of color on okay. the market and uh, the usage of, of the spacecraft that we absolutely grant. I'm fairly new into the CEO position. I've been in the company for a couple of years, um, but I was recently appointed as CEO in the, in the last uh, two months. So this is actually my, what will be my first launch. So I'm actually incredibly excited to, to see the, the, the events on, on Monday. But actually, I'm as excited, if not more excited, because this gives me more things more services, more products to deliver to our, our customer base. And as Martin said, this is an incredibly flexible satellite that we're, we're, we're putting into our fleet. Uh, by the time we've got this up there, we're going to have anywhere between sort of high 60s and 70s, uh, nearly 70 satellites actually in our entire constellation across both geostationary and the medium Earth orbit, the, the, the MEO satellites. That's pretty unique in the industry. But if you take a look at this one, this is really to add to our fleet and our capabilities over the Asia Pacific region. If you go onto our website, you will see really neat coverage maps uh, to the point that Martin said we've got great wide beam coverage, uh, really right over to sort of the, the, east, the eastern parts of Europe, eastern parts of Africa, all the way over to Australia, up into the southern parts of Russia. It really is great coverage. And of course, we've got the very focused high throughput beams that we can lay down wherever we need to have that capacity. So really, that would support both parts of our business. So SES video. Yeah, really, in terms of Asia-Pacific, that seems to be bucking the trend a little bit in terms of the direct-to-home or the, the pay TV market. I think over the next five years, we're expected to see anywhere between 70 and 80 million uh, more consumers of that, and obviously this satellite will be a great way to deliver that content to the homes across all of, all of Asia-Pacific. Uh, if you look at my part of the business in networks, that's really got three groups. We split our customer markets into, into three. Uh, that is government, um, what we call fixed data, and fixed data is the telecommunications companies, the mobile network operators, the cloud companies, etc., and then mobility, which we tend to split into two. Uh, of course, there's more flavors of mobility, but we tend to split that into maritime, uh, as, as Marcus was saying. I, I know pretty much all of our ships by, by, by name and by sight, and that's not actually one of ours, but we do have that particular <laughs> customer there. So I'm looking keenly at which, which radar is on there. That, that's actually not one of ours, but we do have lots, lots of like that. Uh, so maritime is obviously not just the big ones like this in cruise ships, but it's also all of the maritime market, the fishing vessels, the smaller fleets of, of cruise passengers, the, the merchant fish, uh, fishing vessels, sorry, the merchant vessels as well. And lastly, but not least, aero. So that's, these are all really important parts of this new satellite capability. Uh, if you look at aero, uh, particularly in the, so obviously aero connectivity started really strong in North America with the, the early adopters. Now we're seeing the rest of the world, let's call it catch up certainly across Europe and certainly across in the uh, Asia Pacific. 
If you look at the connected aircraft we think we have around about now, there's probably more like a thousand connected aircraft in the Asia Pacific market. We expect that to grow to something in excess of 5,000 connected aircraft in the next uh, five to seven years, something like that. It's hard to predict completely, but something of that order. So a five-fold increase in connected aircraft. If you look at the maritime market, we intend to see something around the order of 70 plus thousand connected vessels across all those types that we have. Again, in that same kind of time frame, that five to, six, five to seven year market, we anticipate that to more than double. So let's say in excess of 175,000 connected vessels of some, some variety or other. Um, and again, you think about some of the key hubs and ports that you have in the Asian Pacific market. Very, very strong shipping businesses, very, very strong oil and gas markets that you have. We really do see this as a central hub for growing that, that maritime business. And if you look at the fixed data market, that's one's harder to predict. If you look at the analyst numbers, it's somewhere between, let's say, 7 to 9% growth on the enterprise market. That's uh, connected corporations, connected headquarters, connected branch offices. Uh, we expect to see something in the order uh, of about a million more connected enterprises through satellite in that same kind of time frame, which again is very significant. Uh, and we expect to see, and uh, we believe, and this is the really hard one to predict, we believe there's around about a billion people in the Asia Pacific market that still don't have good connectivity to the devices that you're all holding in your hands right now. Uh, and satellite is one of the, and sometimes the only way, to connect 2G, 3G, and 4G to those, to those markets. And depending on which part of the market you're working on, it can be any combination of those three technologies, 2G all the way through to, through to LTE, depending on the needs of that particular market. So if you take all those numbers together, this is, this is really uh, exciting for us. Again, on, on video, although it's not the, the piece I look after, you know, I, we take our numbers here, but we do expect to see something like 78 million more subscribers take on those video services in that same, same sort of five year period. So this really is exciting. Uh, we're actually hosting, hosting a number of our customers at this event. Hopefully some will stay for the next few days and, uh, and, and see it there. But as you can imagine, given where we're servicing, uh, a lot of those customers have traveled an awful long way to come with us here, so I hope they can extend it. Uh, some of the others, uh, like the, the aero market, which we tend to serve through the four big guys, if you like. So this is the Panasonic's, Global Eagles, GoGo's, Talis, Life TV. Uh, we tend to serve all of those, and all of those tend to be headquartered more locally to this, this location, so hopefully they can stick around it and see us more. So, you know, I, I take, we'll take any questions, you know, on that fixed data one. I would say, I don't believe the analyst numbers. I think it would be bigger. The one I didn't talk about was cloud. I absolutely do think the adoption of cloud capabilities, and that could be anything from the things that we use personally, but more importantly, all the things like the uh, enabled uh, productivity tools that Microsoft, Amazon, IBM, all of those, those, those folks do. Getting that delivered to all the places that can't be readily connected by fiber, I think that's a huge growth, but it's hard to predict because it's new. It's a new market. So all of those growth then was put together. You know, I, 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 I'm excited about this event, but I couldn't be more excited about that capability we're adding to the, to the Asia Pacific market. It, it, it's simply staggering. So love to take any questions. With really technical stuff, my man here, Martin, will take it out. Anything about the markets and the customers, I'd love to take your questions too.